worship the King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. of you uh, out online. Hi, Stacy. Hi, Mom, I think. Um, welcome. It's a good day to worship the Lord, isn't it? Uh, it's nice and cold outside, so maybe that entices you to move around a little bit more. That would be a good thing. Um, we have the honor of ascribing worth to the only one um, worthy of our worship and praise. Uh, he's our Savior. Um, he saved us. He drew us to himself. Uh, I don't understand why he did that, uh, but I'm glad he did. And as I've been praying for my loved ones who don't know the Lord, that's been the focus of my prayer for many months now. Lord, do for them what you did for me. Because we, we can only credit him for who we are in Christ, right? All of it, uh, we, we give him the honor and the glory for. So uh, as we pray for those that are not yet part of the kingdom, um, please, Lord, would you do for them what you did for us. And let's not be stingy 
in our praise of God for all he's done. He is a great God who's done great, great things. Uh, so why don't you stand up? And I, Lord, I just want to thank you on behalf of my brothers and sisters who I know agree with me right now. Thank you for life in you. Thank you for eyes to see, for ears to hear, for a heart that would respond, even for the ability to lay our will down so that you can be in charge. And Lord, we know we still fight our flesh every day and we know we still have an adversary that's looking for an inroad at every moment, but you have won us. We are yours. And I pray that the, that the most reasonable first thing that we would do for you as we acknowledge all that we have in you would be to give you the best, to be generous in our praise and worship of you. Um, and I pray that you would receive it as a, as a fitting, it's not gonna be what you deserve, Lord, but I pray you would receive it uh, as, as an offering of love and gratitude from our hearts. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Can you hear me? There we go. Heavenly Father, um, I know many in this room have looked to wipe the clean clean, Lord, uh, as we start this new year off, Lord. Uh, we're looking to turn the page and move forward. Many of us have set goals for ourselves, made resolutions, uh, set our sights on things we want to achieve, Lord. I just pray that we don't lose sight uh, of the fact that we can't do any of it without you, Lord. Uh, these goals, these things that we've written on our rocks, these words of motivation, uh, please help us to remember that it can only be accomplished through you, Lord, that you have a will for us, and you have a goal and a plan for us, Lord. I also pray that we will remain steadfast, that we will be on the lookout for roadblocks and hurdles and challenges that are going to come our way, Lord. I pray that we can trust in you, that we can take that step forward towards being better, being closer with you, Lord, this year, because these challenges will come, Lord. I ask that you bless this time together, teach us, guide us, and help us take, take that right first step, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Good morning. Good morning. It's announcement time. All right, all right. Uh, first, and I, I don't know why I'm compelled to share this, but shout out to our hospitality team. The coffee was awesome today. <laughs> yeah. It's like so good, good right? Job. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's always really good. In the, I mean, it was like wake wake you up coffee this morning. I liked it. Really, really good. So good morning. Good morning to those folks online. Uh, announcements. Uh, we've got a bunch of community groups that are starting. For those of you who have not yet participated in a community group, they are on Wednesday and Thursday nights. Uh, the Cappins are hosting one. The Thurmans. Ryan's hosting one. We have a recovery group. All the information is in the back table. There's sign-up sheets. This is a really great opportunity to get uh, more and more connected, not just with each other, but take a deeper dive into, uh, into the Word, uh, and, and it's just a really awesome opportunity. Rhonda and I had a chance to host one, uh, I think it was last, uh, last year. Um, it was really awesome, so I encourage you to take a look at that if you haven't already joined a, a small group. Uh, you can find out information or reach out to groups at caneochurch.com. Somebody will contact you about uh, those community groups that are starting up. Uh, there's also a women's Bible journaling uh, that's starting up January 19th at Wendy's house. The Cappins are busy, <laughs> very busy, uh, with Lorene Robertson. Nice. All right, Lorene. Uh, RSVP for that, women at caneochurch.com, and somebody will, will reach out to you there. Uh, our Caneo youth, we're heading up to Hume, SoCal. How many are familiar with Hume Lake? Many of us have been, yeah, been a part of Hume Lake. Well, Hume just, uh, I don't know if they acquired a property, but there's a new property in the Big Bear uh, Lake Arrowhead area that they're uh, offering up for summer and winter camp. So the youth, we're going to be heading up to Hume SoCal, March 3rd through the 5th. This is our, our blended Caneo Youth Junior and Senior High. We're going to be going up there for two nights up, um, up at winter camp. So we have 13 camper spots. It's a, it's a small group. There's only 13 plus two counselors. So if you're interested in going, uh, let me know, youth at caneochurch.com. Uh, there's a $35 deposit that we're accepting now to hold a spot. It's $239 for the full campership. And next, not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday is going to be the deadline for, for deposits to hold spots because we got to get our list in to Hume for, for those campers. So, all righty. Um, Room remodel. Uh, we, our Caneo Youth, and a few other ministries here are going to be shuffling some rooms around here at the church. Um, that's going to involve some painting and some lifting and some clean out, and we're going to need some volunteers. So, uh, lifting again, organizing, and, and painting. So, Rhonda in the back. Rhonda, would you mind waving? Rhonda's got a, a list on the back table. If you're able to help in any capacity with any one of those, we don't have firm dates yet as when that's all going to start, but that's kind of the, the task that we've identified that we're going to need to get these rooms moving around. The youth, we're really excited. We're moving into a larger space as our group's growing. We're going we're gonna to need it. Uh, and some of the other youth ministries are, and children's ministries are moving around as well. So um, there's going to be some opportunity to serve. We're going to need it. So talk to Rhonda or sign up on that back, back table if you guys are interested in helping out. 
Uh, Caneo Potluck. We love food here at Caneo, do we not? Uh, and I looked at the date here. We've got a Caneo Potluck. This, I think this is the weekend before the Super Bowl. Yes. The Super Bowl is later this year. So this is an awesome opportunity to stretch out the pants, to get the belly going, ready for the Super Bowl. It's like practice, right? Uh, it's a tailgate party theme. Food and signups will begin next week. So if you want to help out with that, it's always an awesome time to get together. And like I said, get, get prepped for the, the, the big game the following week. Um, I'm gonna, I got one more announcement that's not on the list here. Uh, many of you have been praying and keeping Emma uh, in mind. So I kind of wanted to give you guys uh, an update. It's been a little, little while. Uh, many of you know she uh, made it back home right before Christmas, which was awesome. We got to spend Christmas Eve and part of Christmas with her, which was a huge, huge blessing. Uh, she had been going through physical therapy to get herself up, up and, and uh, trying to get walking again. Um, but she did have a little bit of a setback that I want us to, uh, unrelated to her heart, um, she had to have a, a procedure. Um, so I just want to ask that you keep her in mind. She's okay. She's, she's going to be all right. But um, just that she doesn't lose, lose hope and lose faith. This is, you know, I was praying that we are able to overcome setbacks in our life and challenges. And um, we want to make sure that she's able to stay strong and continue that therapy and continue progress towards uh, um, her recovery. So, um, but she should, uh, you know, she should recover okay and be back home and continuing that therapy. And uh, we were blessed, our youth were blessed to have her uh, visit us a couple Tuesdays ago, which was awesome. She surprised the youth. Um, so she's on the right track, but you know, these, these setbacks, um, they will come. Uh, and we just pray that she continues to remain tough. She's a tough kid, and uh, she's, she's fighting. So, um, so that's my Emma update, and the family, obviously, uh, Dan and Mark and, and Ethan, um, that they continue to kind of overcome some of these, these challenges that, that they're facing. Okay? Um, is that it? Did I miss anything? That's it. Let's welcome Pastor Kirk up. <laughs> Thanks, Lucas. So we want to send out our youth and our kids right now. So you guys are dismissed. And I want to pray for you as you go. Uh, Lord, thank you for this next generation in our church. We ask that you would bless them and lead them and make them more like you. Mm -hmm. And everybody said? Amen. Right on. So, uh, and it's been amazing to watch this journey with Emma and to see this, this young lady who's 17 just trusting the Lord at every step. So don't just pray for her on Sundays. Don't just pray for her when Lucas or one of us gives you an update. Just lift her up all the time during this week, next couple weeks, next couple months. Really important time for her to get back on her feet, literally. Amen. Right on? Uh, so I want to give you a little update about our Mexico team. They left yesterday at 6 a.m. in a little sprinkle here uh, in Thousand Oaks. And this is cool. They stayed ahead of the rain the whole time. Uh, and uh, just a total blessing. They, they made it down to Ensenada and, uh, and are having a fabulous time. Last night, they led a couple's uh, evening meeting encouraging marriages down in Mexico. And there were tears and prayer and people stayed late and they said it was beautiful. And right now, our team is sharing testimonies at Mount Zion Church down there. Uh, in Ensenada, and then tonight they'll be at another church, and then they'll be uh, having a time of prayer and encouragement for the leadership of several churches down there in ministry. So just lift up that Mexico team, Lord, we ask you'd use them in powerful ways, and uh, yeah, bring them back with the stories of your miracles. And the view is pretty good. So in fact, the community where we go is called Bella Vista, which means beautiful view, right? Okay, there you go. Uh, and so, uh, and keep, stay tuned, we'll be sending teams to Mexico at least twice a year, maybe three times a year, so you'll have your chance to go. Um, we have, uh, it's January, and we are getting started with a lot of ministries, and there are some people who could really use some help in those ministries. One of those things is little kids. Uh, another one of those things is if you look over at, on the side, we've got our tech people. We need some more people to run slides, some more people to help with live stream, and, uh, and other things like, like Lucas talked about, helping with the room changes and remodels. That slide was really cool that Annie made. 
Wasn't that neat, the hammer with the nail? Anyway, I was, she was looking at me like, did you see that? I did see that. Uh, and so, so I want to pass around a couple clipboards. There are lots of ways to get involved. In fact, we're looking for somebody to barbecue uh, on, the, on the 5th during that tailgate thing. Um, we could use help with events and hosting things and all kinds of things. So anyway, I'm going to pass this around. And then once it makes it through the whole room, just write down if there's some way you can serve uh, once a month over this next year. And then after it makes it through, can you make sure that the clipboards end up in the uh, lobby? Everybody in the back? Yeah? Everybody in the back. You're paying attention, right? Okay. Awesome. And then the last thing is this. We're going um, we're gonna to fill out our Connect cards. So you got some blue cards when you came in. And we're going to do an experiment today. And here's the experiment. We're not going to pass the offering baskets. So here's the, here's the experiment. We're going to see if you will still fill out Connect cards with prayer requests and, hey, I'd like to know more information about this, and here's who I am, and put them in the offering box right back there on the way out. So offerings and Connect cards and all that jazz go right back there. And we want to pray for your needs, and we want to celebrate the answers to prayers that you receive because you might have three or four things that happened in your life, and you're like, look what God did, and this is incredible. We have no idea. And we may be praying for something in your life, that God will break through and this will happen in Gary's life and we can't wait for this to happen. And then Gary never tells us that it already happened. So let's have some two-way communication. And so we would love to reach out to you and pray for you. And we'd love to hear what God is doing in your life. Right. Amen? So take one minute and fill out some things on that card. If you have nothing to fill out, just draw a pretty picture that we will enjoy. <laughs> and, uh, and then put those in that offering uh, box sometime later in the service or on your way out. So the band's just going to play instrumental, take one minute and write, and then we'll sing another song. your throne because you say we can. And so we come, Lord, and we get on our knees um, because that's befitting. And my heart's just full of gratitude this morning, Lord. I don't know what else I would do if I was literally in your physical presence, but just say thank you. Everything is about you, Lord. Our stories are the stories that you're writing. Thank you, Jesus. It all revolves around your throne. Who can know your glory?
grateful for your, for your power and your strength. We're grateful that you give liberally to your children. We give you our glory and our praise. Um, we're so thankful that you, um, you wanted us. We've been bought with a price. We're not our own. We're yours this morning. And so, Lord, we're, uh, we're coming to you with gratitude that we're part of your family, that we're your children, that you're our father, and you take care of us so well. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, folks. Um, let, let's give the band another hand, the two-man, the two-person two band. I don't know whether you noticed or not, but it's almost as if they were playing for three people. Anybody notice a bass, but there was no bass player on stage? Yeah. Let's say thanks to Alex for doing double duty. <laughs> Running sound, he's being an extraordinary multitasker, he's playing bass. I love that. <clears throat> so, have you been liking the rain? Yeah. Seems like people either love it or hate it. At our house, we love it. Um, the rain, um, you remember praying for rain here at church a couple times last fall? So, we prayed for rain, God gave it, and we're, we're grateful. The rain reminds me <clears throat> of uh, a story of the guy who um, took his Native American friend to church one Sunday. And he walked him down front real proudly, and they sat in the front pew. And when it came time for the, for the sermon, the preacher got up there, and he yelled, and he screamed, and he spit, and he gesticulated, and he brought down the hellfire and brimstone. And when they, when they uh, left... The guy asked his friend, what did you think of the sermon? And Native American guys thought for a minute, and he said six words. Great wind, much thunder, no rain. <laughs> Don't you think that, that any time the Bible is taught, there ought to be a little rain? Not a gully washer, uh, but a little gentle shower. And, and I'm not a... I'm not a fire and brimstone person that I'm aware of, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that as we study this, this passage we're going to study this morning, that everybody gets a little gentle shower of rain from studying God's Word, because I've, I've received it as I've, uh, as I've been studying this. <clears throat> At the end of last year, I asked, I asked myself questions that I normally ask myself toward the end of the year anyway. What, what do you want to say to me, God, going into this new year? What kind of a, what kind of a person do you want me to be? What, what kind of a message do you want to communicate to me this year? And um, <clears throat> God knows what's coming. He knows what's coming down the pike. He's not sharing that with me. If he's sharing it with you, I'd, I'd love to have a conversation. Um, but he wants us to experience this year in real time. Um, that's the only way we get to do it. And uh, he, as I was asking him those questions, he was, he was kind enough to direct me to uh, Colossians chapter 1. And I have loved studying this passage. We're going to look at nine verses this morning. <clears throat> um, it's it's going to look like a lot when we put it up on the screen, but we're, once we get in, we're going we're to move pretty quickly. So... Kirk doesn't need to be nervous about, you know, this taking an hour. <clears throat> okay, I'll, all right. Um, Colossians, uh, the book of Colossians uh, is one of four letters that Paul wrote while he was in prison. Probably wrote it between 60 and 62 AD. And he wrote it because he was concerned for the Colossian church. Seems like in, in all of Paul's letters, he expressed his concerns for the churches that he was writing to. When he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, I'm concerned that you're following a different Jesus, different than the Jesus Paul encountered on the road to Damascus. So um, the church in Corinth was being infected by certain viruses. Um, 
the Jewish legalists were coming along and they were saying, you need more than Jesus, you need the Jewish law. And some people were worshiping angels. They were, they were exalting angels and worshiping them and kind of giving Jesus a demotion. The main, the main virus that was infecting the church was Gnosticism. And we've, we've heard Kirk talk about Gnosticism a lot. Um, it's, it's the belief that God is spirit and he's good and everything in the material world is bad. Lens shirt, bad. Pews that you're sitting in, bad. Bodies, our human bodies, especially bad, really bad. And um, so the Gnostics believed that Jesus couldn't possibly have been human and had a human body and he couldn't possibly have come into the world through the body of a young girl. And so Paul's main reason for writing this letter was to refute the heresy that was going on in the church. And he did it, for the most part, not by saying what you believe is wrong. He did it, for the most part, by exalting who Jesus is. <clears throat> so at the start of a, of a new year, I thought it'd be good for me and for us to just take a look at who Paul says is the real Jesus. His centrality, the fact nothing else matters as much as he does. And it, it sounds basic, and some of what we're going to talk about is pretty basic. But I just wonder if it's so basic, why do I get kind of so far off track during the course of a year? If it's so basic, why don't I keep in mind some of these things that Paul writes about? So let's put, um, let's put the entire uh, nine verses up on the screen. We're going we're gonna to look at Colossians 1, if you want to open up your, your Bible or your device. Um, we're going to look at uh, nine verses, verse 15 through verse 23. And Paul, like any good lawyer, he starts making his case for who Jesus is. And he starts making a case for the preeminence of Jesus. Um, that's, a, that's a $10 word, I know. Um, but in my Bible, maybe your Bible too, just um, right at the start of this, these nine verses, there's a heading, and it says the preeminence of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> it's a great word. It means first, first in everything. First in my worship, first in honor, first in my affections, first in my choices, first in everything. And so Paul says, here's why Jesus is first in everything. And I love the way, I love the way Skip Heitzig talks about preeminence. He says preeminence means basically always only Jesus. Always only Jesus. Amen. And the ultimate goal of my salvation and your salvation is not just saving us from hell. The ultimate goal of our salvation is the exaltation of Jesus to a place of preeminence in our lives. Right not top five, not fluctuating somewhere around in the top three. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a huge gulf there's a, there's a grand canyon of difference between prominence and preeminence, isn't there? Um, and Paul, Paul makes the case that Jesus is not to just be prominent. He's supposed to be first in everything. So Paul is saying that in view of who he really is, nothing else makes sense in life. Um, turn over to Matthew chapter 17 for a minute. Um, as, I was, as I was studying this idea of preeminence, um, I, was, I was looking at this passage that's called the Transfiguration. We've, we've heard it taught often. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at it differently these days in light of what Paul says in Colossians 1. Um, Matthew writes, After six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his, kind of his favorite three, Peter, James, and John, and his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. 
And he, Jesus, was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah, a couple of pretty important guys in Jewish history, talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It's like he was babbling. I think it's the, the account in Luke of the same thing where um, Luke writes, and, and uh, Peter didn't even know what he was saying. It's like he's just babbling on and on. If you wish, I'll make a tent for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I think, the, I think the emphasis in that last sentence, listen to him, was not on listen, but I think the emphasis was on him. Peter, Peter was, in a sense, just kind of making Jesus prominent along with Moses and Elijah. I don't, I don't think we can fully understand what was taking place with our non-Jewish minds um, when the disciples saw Moses and Elijah. Um, to us, they're, they're, you know, really important guys in the Old Testament. But to Peter, James, and John, Moses and Elijah are kind of Hall of Fame guys. The top three maybe with Abraham. But Peter is, is kind of making Moses and Elijah co-equal with Jesus. And God the Father says, no, this, <laughs> this is my son. Listen to him. Prominence. Uh, is not a place that Jesus is looking for. And so now in verse 15, Paul starts to tell us why Jesus is to be preeminent. He says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus made that claim about himself, right? Let's, let's, uh, let's turn real quick over to the book of John. John 14, really famous passage. Jesus is talking to his disciples in verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus said, have you been with me so long, Philip? Have you, have you been paying attention at all? Are you deaf, dumb, and blind? Have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, Paul says. If you, if you want to know God's personality, you look at Jesus. If you want to know what God cares about, you look at the life of Jesus. If you want to know God's words, you listen to Jesus. He's, he's God in a skin suit. And um, Paul goes on to say that he's the firstborn of all creation. <clears throat> Some popular cults take that phrase, firstborn of all creation, and they use it to say, see, Jesus wasn't really divine. He was born like anybody else. But what they fail to realize and what maybe they choose to ignore is that that word that's translated into English, firstborn, means first in rank, first in authority. He's the boss. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that he was actually born in a certain birth order. It means he's first in authority. So Jesus is first in authority over all creation. Verse 16 tells us why. By him all things were created. God's agent in creation for everything, visible and invisible, Paul says, kingdoms, authorities, rulers, powers, um, powers that come and, you know, ascend to the throne and then disappear. All of it was created by Jesus, for Jesus, as he kind of superintends everything through history, all of it made by him and for him. So how is that even possible? Verse 17 says that he's before all things. He's preexistent, not created somewhere along the timeline of history. 
preexistent with the Father and with the Spirit. He's, in a sense, prehistoric. Um, and, and he goes on, Paul goes on to say, he holds all things together. <clears throat> what, the, what the heck does that mean? He holds all things together. Science has one answer. Paul has a different answer. Um, I, I'm not a science denier. I'm not a flat earther. I love science. I think it's interesting. I love the scientific method. But let's talk science for a minute. Science says that there are four fundamental forces at work in nature. Anybody know what they are? Smart man. Each student in the front. Gravity. Gravity's one. Anybody else? Gravity, electromagnetism, and then two other things that don't sound very sciencey at all to me. Science says that the other two forces at work in nature are weak force and the strong force. It's, it's, like they took, it's like they took their kids aside and said, let's come up with a name for these other two things. <laughs> Gravity, electromagnetism, weak force and strong force. And strong force, science says, is the strongest force in the universe. It's the force in the universe that keeps atoms from flying apart. Okay, go back to your eighth grade chemistry class and picture, picture an atom, picture the nucleus, picture the electrons orbiting around the nucleus. What kind of particles are in the nucleus? Protons and neutrons, yeah. Neutrons have what kind of charge? Neutral charge. What kind of charge do protons have? Positive charge. You ever tried to take two batteries and put the positive ends together? What happens? You can't do it because like charges repel. So what is it that keeps the nucleus of an atom from just flying apart? Because it's got positively charged particles and then neutral particles. Science says it's the strong force that keeps the atom from flying apart. I just, I find it so hard as a person who is rational most of the time to, to believe in a scientific explanation for why matter doesn't just fly apart with something called the strong force. Paul says Jesus is the strong force in the universe that holds everything, including you and me, together at the atomic level. Um, I think sometimes the Bible is a science book. I really do. Um, and I think if he can hold everything together at an atomic level, that, that, that means he can hold you and me together when it, when it seems like life is just so difficult and, and we just kind of want to fall apart. Jesus can hold us together as well on an emotional level. <clears throat> Verse 18, Paul says that Jesus is the head of the body, the head of his church. He's the head of the church in the Caneo Valley. He's the head of our church. He's the head of some mega church in Texas. He's the head of a, of a church in Africa that meets out in the bush or a church meeting underground somewhere in China. He's the head of his church all over the world. Amen. We're his hands and feet. Why is he head over his church? Because Paul says he's the firstborn from the dead. There's that word firstborn again. It doesn't mean that he was born. It means he's in authority over all resurrections. Right Jesus' resurrection opens a door for you and me to actually be part of his church, part of his body. He even calls himself, Jesus calls himself the door in John chapter 10. He says, I am the door for my sheep. So he's the door to new life for you and me. Others have been resurrected. In scripture, we're told that Moses was resurrected in the Old Testament. Jesus raised at least three people from the dead in the New Testament. But their resurrections were only possible because Jesus is first in authority over all resurrections. Right 
Verse 19 says, in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The complete fullness of who God is, Father, Son, Spirit, dwells completely in Jesus. And as, as he grew from a child to manhood, we see all the characteristics, the fullness of God, of who God is, exhibited in the way Jesus led his life. The fullness of his wisdom. People marveled at Jesus' teaching because they said he doesn't teach like the other rabbis. He doesn't quote somebody else's authority. Scripture says that they marveled at his teaching because he spoke as one who had authority, because he was full of the wisdom of God. He was full of God's eternal nature. He said, before Moses was, I am. He's full of God's power, raising people from the dead, healing the sick. Power um, to resist temptation. The Bible says that he was tempted in every way, just like you and me, but he didn't sin. Creating food out of nothing because he was full of the, of the power of God, full of the justice of God. I love the way uh, the Bible says Jesus took care of the poor in spirit, the down and out, the downtrodden. He... Um, he called out the oppressors. He called out the Pharisees, called them brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. He, he kicked the money changers who were cheating the people out of the temple because he was full of God's justice. Amen. And probably the best example of Jesus representing who God was in all of his fullness is the fullness of his love. As he gave his life on the cross, paying the collective debt for all of our sin for all time so that we wouldn't have to be bound by it, but we could be forgiven for it and set free from it. Amen. And we could, we could probably go on for a long time talking about all the different characteristics of God um, and how they came to fruition and were exhibited in the life of Jesus. Okay. Let's move on to verse 20. Um, I love this. I love these next few verses. This is the gospel. Verse 20 says, Through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. <clears throat> um, reconciliation means to restore a broken relationship and bring peace and harmony between two parties. We need it, obviously, in our world between each other. Seems like, you know, not even the Republicans can get along. Not, not even the Democrats can get along. People who have similar worldviews, they can't even get along. But we need it first. We need reconciliation first with our God, don't we? <clears throat> Paul starts uh, in verse 20 with this huge, big picture panorama of everything that God wants to reconcile to himself through Jesus. And he talks about heaven and earth. Let's go back to Romans real quick. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 21, Paul writes that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. It will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Paul's saying the whole of creation is groaning together, waiting for this reconciliation that God is going to bring about through Jesus. Amen. But then um, we go from huge wide-angle shot down to this, this little portrait. It, it goes from impersonal to personal. And Paul writes in verse 21, and you, go back to Colossians, Paul writes, and you who were once alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled in his body, his body of flesh, uh, by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. <clears throat> we were. Well, I'll speak for me, I won't speak for you. I was at one time hostile and alienated from the Lord, had my back turned to him. And um, 
God looks at us with what uh, Skip Heitzig said is a yes face. Um, he looks at us with a yes face that says, yes, I love you. Yes, I want to forgive you. Yes, I'll accept you. Yes, I'll restore you. And then we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to look back at him with a yes face of our own and say, yes, I want what you have to offer. <clears throat> it's, not, it's not an equal exchange by any stretch of the imagination. I get all of who he is. He gets me. It's not a, it's not a good deal for him, but, but it's, it's the deal he wants to make with us, isn't it? Right? Paul says that this reconciliation that we're offered from God can and should lead to two things. Verse 23. <clears throat> reconciliation happens. What happens next? Paul says continuing is what happens next. Don't stand still. Don't turn your back and walk away. Now that you have seen my yes face, now that you have said yes in return, continue in the faith. It's a, <clears throat> it's, it's a sad fact that Annie and I know dozens of people, you, you guys probably do too, who at one point said yes to God and then decided to just turn their backs and walk away. It's as if, <clears throat> in a sense, um, reconciliation puts us in the game and continuing shows us how to play the game. But some people just don't like the rules of the game. Some, some people don't like the stadium they're playing in. Some people don't like uh, the contract that they signed. And so the sad fact, and I don't, when I say it's a sad fact, I'm not saying what a, what a sad human being you are if you do that. I'm saying it's genuinely sad. Um, it hurts us to see our friends, our family, whoever, turn and walk away. But Paul says, once you've been reconciled, the next step is continuing. Draw near to him. Seek him with your whole heart. <clears throat> and he'll help you if you're reconciled and you continue. He'll help you to do the next thing, which is stand firm. Now, in my, in my Bible, verse 23 um, it's just a little bit more long-winded than some translations. A lot of translations say, stand firm. Um, mine says, continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, and not shifting. That same phrase is translated, stand firm, in a lot of translations. Paul says it throughout his letters, not just to the Colossians, but, but everywhere. He says, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in your faith, over and over. Um, and I think standing firm, what it means to stand firm, is a, is a sermon all on its own. It's a, it's a huge topic. But I just want to talk about three things which I think standing firm means, means for me. The first thing is standing on Scripture. <clears throat> Jesus is the Word become flesh. Um, he's the living word of God. If we're standing on the word of God, we're standing on who Jesus is. If we're trusting in Jesus, we're trusting in his word. Um, and by trusting in his word, we have the ability to find him, find who he is in these pages. And I think this year, God wants me I think he wants us, more than ever before, to stand uh, on his word. Right on. Not just, not just um, give it a cursory reading every once in a while. Not just coming to church and hearing it taught, and then go home and not, not feeding ourselves with it throughout the week. Not, not hearing it, and then forgetting it, and then not living like it. I, th I think... I'd, I think I'm not going to be satisfied with that this year, and I hope you're not either. <clears throat> if Jesus is preeminent, we're going to find who, who he is through his word. 
Second way to stand firm, stand on scripture. I think he wants us to stand with each other. I think we do, uh, here at Caneo, a really good job of that. I I think we really do. We're not made to live life by ourselves. We're not made to pursue Jesus by ourselves. We're We're not created with the ability to stand firm by ourselves. I think at some point this year, uh, every single one of us is going to need support from all sides. Um, Scripture says, bear one another's burdens, right? Um, If you're trying to carry the load all by yourself, you're going to be top-heavy and you're going to be off balance and you're going to be easily pushed over and it's going to be impossible to stand firm unless we're allowing others to help us. Um, I I say that as somebody who would just, a lot of the time, uh, rather carry the load myself. I just would. I just, if it, um, if if there's a load that needs to be carried, dug on it, I know how to carry it, and (laughs) I'm going to do it myself. And it sounds stupid coming out of my mouth, but Um, this year, sometimes we're going to need to be the ones that help others carry their load, and sometimes we're going to have to be the ones who allow others to help us carry our own. Lastly, I think standing on Scripture, standing with each other, uh, lastly, uh, in order to stand firm, we're going to need to stand next to Jesus. Um, and And I think that means right next to him, right? Uh, let's, let's not be satisfied with following from a distance this year. Because if we do, it's way, way too easy for things to get in between us and Jesus. And if something gets in there, let's deal with it really quickly. Let's get it out of the way. Don't, I'm, I'm speaking to myself, <laughs> don't be satisfied with Jesus as just one prominent thing among other prominent things. Not like, not like Peter. Uh, don't say, Lord, if it seems good to you, I'll build a tent for you, and then I'll build one for my finances, and I'll build one for my family, and I'll build one for whatever. Uh, Jesus is to be preeminent. Always, only Jesus. And the only way we're going to um, figure that out in life is to stand right next to him. Okay, I want to invite the band to come back up. <clears throat> While they're walking up, Alex, you can stay seated. <laughs> um, I, hope you guys, I hope you guys don't feel like um, this morning was primarily about theology, primarily about de- defining terms, uh, talking about what words mean in the original um, in the original language, even though we've looked at stuff like preeminence and preexistence and reconciliation and things like that, um, the goal of any good theology is a closer walk with Jesus. Amen. If I'm going to keep him preeminent in my thinking, in my practice, I have to stand right next to him and it's, it's all about keeping my relationship with him free and open and unobstructed and honest. Um, that way, we're going to be able to stand firm this year. Um, and so what I'd like to do during our last little segment of time is just to give you guys some options, just multiple choice. And feel free to do one or, or all of these things. Number one... If God, if God tapped you on the shoulder about um, wanting to have a conversation with you maybe about whether or not he's preeminent in your life, um, that's a really good and important conversation to have, and I think the best thing we could do is to have that conversation with him. Um, maybe maybe while, um, while we were looking at Colossians, God spoke to you about your word for the year. Um, maybe you've been, you've been listening and you haven't had a word yet and maybe God gave you a word while we were talking there's, 
There's rocks, there's Sharpies up here. Feel free to come on up and grab one and write your word down. If you guys want to pray with anybody about anything, maybe you need help standing firm. Um, Scott and Julie Thurman are going to be over here in the pew up front. Kirk will be up here up front. I'll be up here. Um, We'd love to talk with you, pray with you, help you stand firm in whatever it is that wants to knock you over. Um, Lastly, maybe, maybe you are thinking after hearing what it means to be reconciled with God, maybe you are coming to the conclusion, I don't think, I don't think I'm, I'm reconciled to God. I don't think I've ever looked back at him with a yes face and said, yes, I want that. Uh, if that's you, feel free to come on up and talk to one of us. We'd love to have that conversation with you. Um, the band's going to play a song um, about the name of Jesus and who he is. And while the, while the music plays, just feel free to have those conversations with the Lord that you need to have. Okay? Amen. All right.
set it right in front of us. And he's saying, walk in freedom, your new creations in me. Live like the new creations you are. There's just no place for fear, brothers and sisters. There's no place. Thank you, Lord, for the peace that you offer us. Lord, this week, help us to keep our minds stayed on you so that we can walk in your peace. Thank you, Lord, that you long to shine light in the dark places in our hearts and our minds. Thank you that we can speak your name when we don't have the light that we need. Lord, this week, help us to stand on your word help us to be willing to stand with others and lord help us to draw near to you help us to stand right next to you this week we pray that in jesus name amen 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 um i thought for our our benediction this this week um I'd just pray a prayer that Paul wrote in that first chapter in Colossians, right before the, the passage we, start, we started studying. Paul writes this, and this is, this, is, uh, this is my prayer for us this week. Lord, fill us with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and all understanding. Help us to walk in a manner worthy of you, pleasing to you, bearing fruit, growing in our knowledge of you. Lord, strengthen us with your might and help us endure with patience and always give thanks with joy. I pray that for me and for my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a great week, you guys. Enjoy the rain.